Hey guys, and welcome back to my channel. So it is April 1st, it is April Fools, even though this video is probably going up on April 2nd. Um, but we are here to do my monthly wrap up for March of 2024. Now, unfortunately, I only made it through four novels, but they are all full length novels, and three of them are like relatively new releases. And I'm going to blame my inability to get through more than four books this month on this book entirely. And I have a full in-depth rant review about this book um, because this was so difficult for me to get through and I just refused to DNF it. Um, but it really took up so, so much of my reading this month, uh, like my reading time this month. And I'm not great and I'm not happy about it, but it happens, it happens. Um, anyways, without further ado, let's dive through, um, these books because I have a book I hated and I have a book I loved and all of these books, uh, will have full-length in-depth reviews on my channel. Three of them are already up and the final one will have a review going up right after this video. So, let's dive in. Alright. Let's talk about it. I don't even think I want to say too much more about this, but this is Full Immersion by Gemma Amor. This was marketed as, like, a... I don't know, introspective, like, kind of murder mystery story to me. I'm gonna read the back of the book. Um, Magpie is out of ideas. She's desperate enough to try anything. Just when she thinks her life can get no worse, she discovers herself, or rather, her own dead body, partially buried in the mud bank of a river. A man stands by, a familiar stranger. What does he want? And why can't she remember getting here? Why can't she remember anything? Unbeknownst to her, two pairs of eyes watch from behind an observation screen in a room filled with computers and sensors. An experiment is unfolding, but Magpie is the subject, or is she the practitioner? Reality becomes a slippery concept, and beyond the glass is something worse still, a hint of an outline shaped in darkness. Magpie realizes all too soon that her journey has transformed from healing to survival. She must become the hunter rather than the hunted, with her missing memories the prey. In turn, brutal, beautiful, and absolutely terrifying, Full Immersion is the latest speculative horror from Gemma Amor. I wouldn't even come close to qualifying this book as the horror genre. This is the sci-fi, and this is kind of the idea of, like, bringing AI and computers to more of a human interpretive level. There's a lot of things going on with this book, and none of them I enjoyed for the most part. Um, I really don't even want to talk about this book more than I already have in my video because it was such a like drag for me to get through, but I didn't find this book scary. Um, I really didn't love our main character, and I felt that there was a lot of like misogynistic um, messages in this book. Um, a large portion of this novel deals with um, postpartum depression. That is something I have no experience with. I am in no way, shape, and form a medical professional, so I can't really comment on that condition at all. But the way this book writes about it, I don't think Gemma Amore fully understands it either because I think it really conveyed some really, really toxic messages. This is a book that really wants to tell the reader that a manipulative, um, abusive relationship with your husband is okay, that women are designed for being childbearing mothers, and that is what their sole purpose is, and they need to be happy with that even if they don't like it, um, and a lot of other not-so-fun things to read about. Um, it is done in a way that uh, really limits our characters to pretty much three main characters and one kind of scary villain, I'll call him, um, because I really don't want to call him, like, a main character. I just found him evil and unlikable. Um, and banks on a twist that I not only saw coming, but, uh, is revealed to our main character, and she refuses to acknowledge or accept it for, like, another 30 to 50 pages. So we really get a nice, like, double reveal on the twist when she finally is like, oh, I get the twist now. It's infuriating. Um, so didn't love this book. This was a two-star read for me. The only reason it wasn't a one-star is because I found the scenes where we have uh, our two lab techs talking enjoyable. And I thought they were kind of lighthearted to the depressing episode that uh, Magpie's actual 
uh, story herself and her own journey was. So really disliked this book. If you really want me to dive into it, I have a whole review where I just like exhaust myself to oblivion talking about everything I hate about that novel. Um, so check that out if you were interested, but I can't even talk about this book anymore. I disliked it so much. Next up, we have The Haunting of Velkwood by Gwendolyn Kist. Uh, I received this in Sirens. Really, really loud sirens. Sorry, guys. That was like the longest siren ever. Um, I think they're going away now. Yeah, I think they're going away. Anyways, I received this in my latest Nightworms package. Um, I had never heard of, um, I had never read Gwendolyn Kissed before, but I had heard of her writing before. And I was really, really interested in the premise of this. I'm going to read the inside flap of this cover as well. Um, and again, I do have a full in-depth review on this novel. The Velkwood vicinity is the topic of occult theorists, tabloid one-hour documentaries, and even some pseudoscientific investigations. Oh my god. What is happening out there? Okay. <laughs> As the block of homes disappeared behind a near impenetrable veil that only three survivors could enter, and only one has in the past 20 years, until now. Talitha Velkwood has avoided anything to do with the tragedy that took her mother and eight-year-old sister, drifting since then from one job to another, never settling anywhere or with anyone, feeling as trapped by her past as if she was still in the small town she so desperately wanted to escape. When a new researcher tracks her down, and offers to pay her to go back to enter the vicinity, Talitha claims she's just doing it for the money. Despite all the crackpot theories over the years, no one has discovered what happened the night Talitha and her estranged former best friends, Brett and Grace, escaped their homes 20 years ago. Will she finally get the answers, or is this just another dead end? I have mixed feelings on this novel. Uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about is Gwendolyn Kiss's voice. I really, really, really like her, her entire tone when writing. It made this book very readable, very digestible, very interesting to me. I wanted to keep turning the page. Um, it's only, it's just over like 200 pages and I was able to read the first like 115 pages in the first day. Um, so it's definitely a voice that I click with. My problem, however, was that I couldn't click with the characters at all. Um, I found them to be extremely flat and one-dimensional and showing very, very, very little growth, even though we're seeing both their teenage counterparts reflected in their present day, like kind of 40 year old counterparts. Um, and then I found the story to really need fleshing out. This is one of those instances where I think if the book had been longer and kind of trimmed a lot of the, um, unnecessary side characters to focus more on developing our main characters and developing the lore in this story, I would have really, really enjoyed it. Because the ideas are there. The ideas are definitely there. Um, this is marketed as like a haunting. I don't think it is. It's kind of this like weird interdimensional Schrodinger's cat, are they alive or dead moment. Um, and that's really, really cool. And it feels more like an imprint haunting. Um, and then it does like a traditional ghost story. So if you're going in for something that like follows the lines of like how ghosts normally act in uh, like fiction um, and folklore, this is not going to follow that. Um, and not in the way that September House does, where it's just a very like unique version of a haunted house. This just really, I don't think it, ghosts were the right word for this. Um, that's not to say it's not cool, but because she's kind, of, Gwendolyn Kiss is kind of banking on the fact that she's using the term ghost. Um, she kind of brushes a lot of explanations and world building for this kind of interdimensional unit aside. And there's a character named Edith who is very, very pivotal and very crucial to that plot point and storyline. And I wanted more from her and I felt like Gwendolyn Kist kind of left her storyline in this kind of like vague, open-ended moment to kind of add to the mystery to it. But I didn't want that. I really wanted to know more because I wanted her to expand on this kind of unique concept and I never got that. Uh, this book is also overly saturated with characters that I don't think matter. Our main characters really are Talitha and Brett. Um, I don't think the story necessarily needs Talitha's little sister. I don't think the story necessarily needs Grace. I don't think the story necessarily needs Talitha's mother. And I don't think the story necessarily needs any of the researchers including Jack, that kind of pushed the plot forward. 
they don't seem important enough and I feel like the story could have happened with or without them and just little different um motives to get our main characters to be where they end up at the the climax of this um and again reading about them I kept thinking oh these side characters are gonna like have something to do with the overarching story and they they really didn't the only characters who really mattered were Brett's family Edith Brett and Talitha everything else was just kind of filler to me and it felt like filler and I don't always hate filler Stephen King is pretty good at doing like really scary like side stories as filler to kind of create a mood but when you have a book this short I don't want that when I could have more exploratory um, explanations into the plot and more in-depth character building for our leads um, and that's what this book really really lacked um, again, I definitely go in a lot more, um, I definitely go in depth a lot more in my own standalone review, um, but those were the key takeaways for this. It definitely, definitely unique, and I really did enjoy her writing style, but the story just didn't work for me. So it was a three-star read, because I wouldn't ever say no to reading another Gwendolyn Kiss novel. It didn't put me off from her writing at all. I just don't think this was a story that worked for me. And again, it kind of borderlines that almost like sci-fi element more so than horror. And I will say the scariest thing in there is this concept of like humans are scarier than the supernatural, which is this thing that I absolutely love. But I found like the what's scary to be extremely cliche and just something I've seen done so many times. And when we have this interdimensional world that is really unique and I haven't seen done a bajillion times, I'd rather the focus and originality be on that than banking on something that gets regurgitated consistently to be our like focal point of like, ooh, scary evil you know so there's that all right next up mr lullaby by jh markert i am definitely becoming a jh markert fan um he wrote uh the nightmare man back in 2023 like early 2023 this was his latter uh 2023 release this only came out a couple months ago i love the cover i gush over his covers i buy his books because his covers are so great his covers literally are always so misleading to what the actual narrative is about, and so are the inside flaps, uh, as is this one. I'm gonna read it anyway, though. The small town of Herod's Reach has seen its fair share of the macabre, especially inside the decrepit old train tunnel around which the town was built. After a young boy, Sully Dupree, is injured in the abandoned tunnel and left in a coma, the townspeople are determined to wall it up. Deputy Sheriff uh, Beth Gardner is reluctant to buy into superstitions until she finds two corpses at the tunnel's entrance, each left with strange calling cards inscribed with old lullabies. Soon after, Sully Dupree briefly awakens from his coma. Before falling back into his slumber, Sully manages to give his older brother a message. Sully's mind, since the accident, has been imprisoned on the other side of the tunnel in La La Land, a grotesque and unfamiliar world inhabited by evil mythical creatures of sleep. Sully is trapped there with hundreds of other coma patients, all desperately fighting to keep the evils of the dream world from escaping into the waking world. Elsewhere, a man troubled by his painful youth has for years been hearing a voice in his head he calls Mr. Lullaby, and he has finally started to act on what that voice is telling him, to kill any coma patient he can find quickly. Something is waking up in the tunnel, something is trying to get through, and Mr. Lullaby is coming. The fact that it, say, it doesn't say Mr. Lullaby is coming for you, making it like a rhyme, the missed opportunity, but whatever. I don't like the inside flap of this book because a lot of what was said doesn't actually happen in the novel. And it's an oversimplification and a rewriting of the narrative to kind of get the overall tone and plot across. What I do appreciate about this book that Mr. Uh, the Nightmare Man didn't have is that this actually kind of tells the reader that it kind of begins as a murder mystery, but does kind of devolve into this kind of weird fantasy dream world over the top epic kind of story um and knowing that after having read the nightmare man and going into this with that premise like i understand where jh marker is as a writer um but i really want to make sure that you guys know that it's clear because jh marker writes the beginnings of really good crime thrillers and then they kind of get oversaturated with these kind of fantasy creations um and become something else entirely now i don't hate that uh i will say i usually don't love fantasy but i don't hate that because i think his dream world um that is consistently the same throughout the nightmare man and mr lullaby they're not sequels but they do take place in the same world and they do reference one another um 
I like it. I, I don't necessarily think it's scary, but I think it's creative. I think it's cool, and I love how he pulls in all of these elements of folklore. Um, and I think he's doing a really good job at at his world building. What what this lacked, this is this is bringing in. Um, however, very similar to the haunting of Velkwood, I can't say I loved the characters, even though I did enjoy his writing style. Um, every Every single villain in this book I think is well done, well written, creative. I want more from those villains. I felt like this this is this is a world of villains who are all kind of serial killers. It's not really a spoiler, it's just kind of you're gonna find that out really quickly. And they're all very creative. Like they to me they feel just like like something you would see in an episode of Hannibal. Like they feel very much like a Brian Fuller villain. And I really enjoyed that. What I didn't love is our main character, uh, Beth. I thought she was awful. She is kind of lauded as this like amazing, um, dedicated, loyal police uh, sheriff or deputy or she, whatever. She, she's like the main force on the, she's the main person that we're reading this uh, story through. And I just found her despicable. I found her morally awful. I found her selfish. I found her, um, just to be honestly, one of the most unlikable characters I've ever read in a lead. I really, really hated her. Um, I thought she was mean. Um, and it's just consistently glossed over, like, how mean she is to her, like, I guess, quote-unquote best friend, who really gets the short end of the a, a stick kind of a lot. His name is Gideon. Um, and while I liked Gideon as a character, again, we, we don't get much of him because he's really overshadowed by this Beth character. And then we have Maddie, who is another character that really pushed my suspension of disbelief because I am willing to sit here and be like, cool, like Dreamland exists, monsters from another universe can come through tunnels, like, like, I, I can believe all of that. I, if you set it up in the story and it makes sense, I can believe all of that. What I cannot believe is that a random 22-year-old girl can convince random strangers across America to believe in the thing she is saying with little to no proof and just either A, show up at their house or B, be like, hey, I'm like on the phone. I don't believe that and I really wish that that had more explanation behind it because it just felt lazy. It just felt like it was being said to push the story along to get where we wanted to go. The other issue that I had with this book is that it really doesn't have an ending. And I said this and I complained about it in my review, but I felt this whole time as I was approaching the end of the story that there wasn't enough, there weren't enough pages left for the story to be fully told. So then I got into thinking, I was like, oh no, I just accidentally picked up another series or like maybe we're going to find out the Nightmare Man and Mr. Lullaby are all connected and it's going to be one large series and I just didn't realize it. Nope, it's a standalone novel. This is a standalone novel, but it doesn't have an ending. We get almost every plot line left entirely open. And it, it, it ends on a freaking cliffhanger. It ends on a cliffhanger, and it ends on a cliffhanger that I don't care about. And it's not like one of those like vague endings like Paul Tremblay does in like um, House uh, Captain at the End of the World, where like you can look at like two possible options and like kind of figure out what the two options are and choose which one like makes you feel better. You know, Turn of the Screw does this as well with um, uh, the nan or the governess and Miles and their storylines and how they end. Uh, but for this, I, I have no room for interpretation because I don't know what happens. And if there is an ending set down, there's like major plot holes that all of a sudden come out, which makes me think that's why he didn't write an ending. Now, I will say this novel was actually um, written before The Nightmare Man. He did write it before, stopped in the middle of it, wrote The Nightmare Man, published The Nightmare Man, then came back to this. Um, so it definitely reads far more like a uh, debut novel than The Nightmare Man does, and I think that that's why. But I enjoyed the story of The Nightmare Man overall. This one, I enjoyed the journey and really was not satisfied with the ending. So three stars, three stars. I will absolutely read his um, upcoming novel, Sleep Tight. The cover also looks very, very cool, but I like this world he's created and I like what he's trying to do. Um, and I think, again, it's, it's very, very different and it's very, very out there, but I definitely want him to kind of tie up some of the loose ends that he creates in his stories because I feel like they, they stay loose. <laughs> they stay loose. Okay, and last but not least, I did it, guys. I read it. 
I read it. I'm so happy with it. Uh, this is The Hollow Dead by Darcy Coates. And I'm not going to read the back of this book because this is book four in the Gravekeeper series. I love this series. I hate series. I am not a series person. Um, but I will read every single book that uh, comes out in the series. I believe there's only one more. Um, but I love this. If you don't know uh, what the Gravekeeper series is, Darcy Coates is a kind of like cozy horror author. So she writes kind of like cute, comforting ghost stories that have some really, really messed up imagery in them. And I, it's a very fun balance. I read her books as palate cleansers when I read something that's too dark, or I want to pull myself out of a reading slump and read something that I know is probably going to be a four or five star read. It's, it's very rare that Darcy Coates released a book that I don't like, though it does happen. Um, the basic premise of this is we follow our lead, Kira, who wakes up one day in the woods. She has no memory of how she got there or what's happening, but she's being chased by this group of men. She is able to lose them um, in the small town of Blighty where she befriends uh, a pastor and two kind of oddballs and kind of rebuilds her life there while trying to figure out how she ended up there and who these men are who are chasing her um, and why they're after her. At the same time, she also learns that she can see and communicate with the dead. She sees ghosts and she uses her powers to help them move on, a lot of times figuring out what unfinished business they have left behind. So we follow Kira and her friends Zoe and Mason on this journey to figuring out who she is and why she's there. Um, the first book is absolutely fantastic but reads more like a traditional Darcy Coates, like almost standalone novel. Books two and three, we really start to get large revelations. And book four, we actually start to really get answers. And I am so happy because I have been waiting for these answers. And now it's getting weird and convoluted and all over the top. And there's like magic cats and like a bad guy who has a name and returning nemesises. And Zoe's getting a much more fleshed out um, backstory. And finally, and most importantly, Harry Kennard, the goth kid, who has kind of made cameos in books one, two, and three, is having more of a dominant role in the friend group, the friend group of Zoe, Kira, and Mason. And I'm really happy they're finally doing it because Harry and Zoe are my two favorite characters and I really hate how Harry is this like major side character. I want him to fully be indoctrined as a lead character with our other three. Um, I think he really balances out the group and the dynamic and he's very very funny to read about. Kira is our like cliche main character heroine. Mason is our like very very responsible uptight potential love interest. Zoe is the quirky one who has kind of a dark past. And then you have Harry who again is just this kind of like oddball goth character who brings so much lightness and humor to some of the heaviness of the story and I just really enjoy him and I really hope that for book five he remains a main character and if Darcy Coates wants to extend this to like six, seven, eight, nine, ten books I would keep reading this because I just have so much fun with the characters and the setting um, and the mystery behind it all and I I think book three was probably the weakest even though it gave us the most answers but this one might actually be my favorite. Um, I really, really enjoyed this. This was a perfect five stars for me. I read this so quickly and it was just so fun and over the top and it's now kind of expanded outside of the the constraints of like Blighty and like the small town. I'm really getting a huge look at what this organization is and who Kira is and how her friends all connect and I just adore this series. And that's so rare for me because I hate series so much in general. Um, but yeah, I'm really, really, really happy about this and I will be doing a full in-depth review on this. Um, I'm going to try and keep it spoiler free for this book, but it won't be spoiler free for the series because um, I want to be able to talk about things that happened in books one, two, and three, and I don't really want to do that here in this video. So keep a look out for that. That should be the next video that I upload. Anyways, that is all that I have for you guys today. As always, I try to post every Monday and Thursday, sometimes on Saturdays. And if you enjoy these videos, please the like and subscribe buttons down below, and I will catch you on the next one. Mwah.